Welcome to our Facebook Live Q&A with our district's academic leaders today. My name is Amy Littman. I work for the communications department here for the school district of Palm Beach County. We have done a couple of these Facebook Live Q&As before. If you haven't seen them, you can definitely scroll down on our Facebook page and find those. But we are happy to have you here with us this evening to really talk about academics. We are going to discuss what classrooms look like right now, what they're going to look like in the coming months, as well as supports and services for students with disabilities, exceptional student education, as well as English language learners. And so I am joined here with members of the academic team, including our chief academic officer, Dr. Glenda Sheffield. Dr. Sheffield, introduce your staff who are with you here today um, and tell us a little bit about how things are going right now in the world of academics. Well, of course, good afternoon, um, Amy, and thanks for having the team. We're definitely excited to be here and just share with the community in regards to, you know, what some of the things that are happening within academics. As you know, we are, we know that we are currently in brick and mortar as well as continuing our distance learning platform. So we're looking forward to just sharing you know, some of the things that are happening. Joining me this evening, of course, I'm with academics. I'm just excited to have Diana Fetterman, our assistant superintendent for our teaching and learning. Um, also, we have um, Kevin Morcomet, our director for um, our ESE, um, Exceptional Student Education, and also Harvey Oaka, um, the director for multicultural education. So we're just excited to be here as a team. Yeah, thank you so much to all of you for joining us. We'll get into a little bit of each of your areas of specialty um, as we proceed through this hour. I want to remind everyone that we will be taking questions live um, for this Facebook Live, but we also have some questions that we'll start going through to give you an idea of just the state of academics in the School District of Palm Beach County right now. And so, Dr. Sheffield, one of the biggest changes this week has been that families had to lock in their choice for either distance learning or in-person learning for the remainder of the semester. That had to be finalized on the family's parts yesterday. Schools are going to be processing those. I believe they take effect as of November 4th. And so I think a lot of the questions we've received on Facebook about that have to do with scheduling changes and if students will still have the same teachers that they've made connections with so far this school year. So um, where do we stand with that? Well, Amy, we know the Make Your Choice 2.0, yes, it did end on yesterday. And that came about by listening at our communities, um, our stakeholders, you know, our principals and our teachers as it pertains to, you know, the first two weeks of school, I'm um, going into the to week three and week four as it pertains to the simultaneously teaching. And some of our teachers were doing an outstanding job with it. And then we also had some teachers that, you know, that felt that they really and truly, really it would work best for our students because they saw where our students were having some, some challenges as it pertains to having their classmates um, brick and mortar and having, of course, their classrooms that are virtual um, to where the teachers were trying to teach or are teaching both groups. So in listening at um, our stakeholders, because that's very important to us, we decided to ask our families to lock in um, for the semester um, to see if they would want to um, their decision of returning to brick and mortar for the semester or to remain on distance learning. And what that will allow us to do is to really look at that data and to see if there is a possibility for us to match up our teachers that are working remotely with our students that are distance learning, you know, to where they are focusing on one particular group of students. Then our students that are brick and mortar, um, pairing them with the teachers that are brick and mortar. Now the data is going to drive all of this. Is it going to be perfect in regards to having that perfect match? Um, probably not in regards to the percentages that we are seeing that are coming in. But what we want to do is that if we can decrease the number of classrooms, the number of teachers that are having to do the simultaneously teaching, that's what we want to do. Our ultimate goal is to set our students up for success, set our teachers up for success. So we, so that's the purpose behind all of that. And the reality of it is, and I think you ask me as it pertains to will they be scheduled changes? What we know in terms of doing that, yes, they will be scheduled changes. But we will love to keep those schedule changes very limited and we will do our best. 
That's where the principal supervisors, along with our deputy superintendent chief of schools, who supervises schools, will be working with each schools, um, the principals, and looking at their master boards and looking at the, the numbers that came in from the surveys in regards to the students that will be returning and those that will be remaining and their teacher data as well. So we will do our very best. Again, I hear the parents, I hear them loud and clear that they will prefer not to have the schedule changes. But when we are making, when there is a change and there's a change for the good, and we're wanting to, say again, set our parents, excuse me, set our students and set our teachers up for success, there will be some schedule changes, but we will love to limit the amount of schedule changes that occur. And of course, um, you know, saying we want parents to be successful too, that kind of goes into parents have been playing a critical role in even more so in student education when they already were, obviously. Um, but learning from home, doing distance learning presents additional challenges for families. What are some of the supports that we've put in place mm -hmm. since March to really help families through that process? Well, I will start with that, and you're absolutely right. And I'm just, I cannot thank the parents enough because they are truly have just been troopers and they have um, really shifted into this current space in which we are in. And in keeping our parents in mind, and you know, as we shifted from spring into the fall, and yes, there were a lot of planning that went over into this over the summer. And Diana, of course, will talk about some of that, is that one thing that we are definitely proud of is we're proud of our, of our Palm Skills Academy. Mm -hmm. And that Palm Skills Academy is similar to Khan Academy, but it's all tied into our standards. And what that is, it's a, it's a, excuse me, it's a digital platform of the Palm Skill Academy to where it's all standards based and it helps our students to where they can log on to reinforce and enrich the skill of the standards that have already been taught. But as I indicated, Diana will talk a little bit more about that. And I'm also pleased in regards to, you know, the parents onboarding videos um, and other resources that we made available for our parents. And all of that is located on our COVID-19 website, you know, on the, the platform. So I just encourage the families to just look at all the resources that we've made available to help navigate in that space. But of course, Diana and the team have done a lot of work with that. So I would like her to elaborate on those resources and particularly our Palm Skills Academy. Thank you, Dr. Sheffield. So, well, first let me start with that, those parent onboarding videos. They're, the teams have created so many videos for our parents because our parents really have been, first of all, as you said, our, our parents have always been partners in education. Districts cannot be successful without parents, but not just parents, families, communities being true partners in this entire educational process. And we really have seen during this entire pandemic that's even more so now. So we have been so grateful for that continued partnership. But the videos that we have really take parents, just like we do with our students, from wherever they are. So sometimes the videos are just about how do you access email or how do you log on to the portal? Um, it's very basic pieces that some of our parents just need. And again, available in different languages to make sure that our parents and our families and our communities can log on and help. But then some of the videos get into more detailed pieces. How do you access different learning platforms that your students might be using? Um, how do you access the textbooks that your students might be using? How can you set them up for success, create great study habits? So wherever our parents and our families come in, those videos are there to help. And then as Dr. Sheffield said, as our families are then working with the students, realizing that they, they see some learning gaps that their students might have, or perhaps their students come to them and say, I need help with this particular skill those videos are there where the parents can turn to. Because as a parent myself that had children, you know, grow up through the district, sometimes your kid comes to you and you go to help. And what you hear as a you know, parent is, well, that's not the way my teacher told me to do it. Well, those videos there, those videos are the way their teacher showed them to do it. And that's a huge help. And our students can access those Palm Skills video. Uh, via the portal on the website. So if they just, the students go to their portal on the website, they type in Palm Skills, they can get right to those videos, all different grade levels and the different subject areas, and those can help a lot. 
Yeah, Palm Skills really does sound like it has just been an amazing tool for students and families uh, mm -hmm. to really get involved in the standards that are being taught at the moment, as well as to even review previous standards. And that is something that is playing a role in the classroom right now, correct, about making sure students are caught up from suddenly going into distance learning in March. So, uh, Diana, Absolutely. if you could tell me a little bit about how that's working for teachers when they have students who might not have fully grasped some concepts at the very end of last school year. Um, absolutely. So we know that not every one of our students enjoyed the same type of learning experience in the spring last year. So in order to help our teachers, help our students, what we did was when we built this year's scope and sequence, and that's something that the Department of Curriculum creates each year and provides to our teachers who do all the heavy lifting of instruction each year. But what it does is it lays out all the standards for a particular year. Well, what we did is we embedded all of the different topics, all of the, the different skills that students were supposed to learn from March 13th on last year, and then embedded them into this year's scope and sequences. Because again, a lot of students may not have thoroughly grasped what they were supposed to learn at the end of the year last year. And for example, for a fourth grade reading teacher, that fourth grade reading teacher is probably an expert at fourth grade reading, but not, might not know all the third grade reading benchmarks. So we pulled out all of those third grade reading standards and, pull, and put those into the fourth grade reading scope and sequence. So then that way the teacher has them right there at the tip of their fingertips. So it's a little bit easier for them to teach it. And we are getting some questions about how teachers and parents can really work together right now to make distance learning in particular successful. What are some ways that we are doing that? I, I think, well, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, one way that we're doing it is that, you know, our teachers are, they're doing their office hours. Um, parents should be emailing the teachers if they need to schedule office hours time. And I, and I just encourage, you know, the parents to continue to have that, uh, that collaboration, you know, with the teacher, with the school principal, school assistant principal, you know, a guidance counselor, and all the resources that are there on the campuses. And, you know, as Diana was talking about, um, Amy, and I do want to mention, as it pertains to, you know, talking about the summer, you know, we used to say the summer slide, now it's the COVID-19 slide, as it pertains to those standards that were taught last year. And another thing that we're doing this year in regards to help gauging that is um, right now, you know, we finished up with our iReady diagnostics. You know, we had our success maker diagnostics in math. And um, our high school students just finish up with, um, well, they'll be finishing tomorrow um, their fall diagnostics and that we have not done in, in, pre, you know, in the past in a few years. And our middle school will, will finish up diagnostics on the 23rd. Our elementary students are beginning their diagnostics. And the reason that we are doing fall diagnostics is that we are using that data, nothing punitive. We're using it to assist with informing teaching and learning. And the more data that we have was going to help the teachers drill down um, to each individual students and making certain that we can assist them in providing and differentiating the instruction based on the needs of the students. And I think that that was very important because I don't want parents to think you know, as they're doing the diagnostics, all of these assessments, I ready success maker, that is just another test. It is not um, just another test and we're, it's nothing being punitive. It's just that we want to use it to inform teaching and learning. So with that, the academic honesty is just gonna be so important, you know, particularly with our secondary students because the, the accurate, the data is the accurate of the support that we can do to assist our students. And jumping off that theme of support and making sure that we know exactly where students are at right now and where we need to get them, that brings me over to both Kevin and Harvey here. What are both of your departments doing for your populations to ensure that students don't ex haven't experienced that COVID-19 slide? I think you both have some strategies that you are employing your, your departments in that regard. So for students with disabilities, <clears throat> we're doing the best we can to make sure that we're capturing present levels of performance. So every child with an IEP um, has service providers that um, work with them on a daily basis and, and get that present level. Um, if we look back at where children were performing in March when we went out, uh, we were, are trying to compare that data to where they're performing now. So if we see that slide, 
we are adjusting their plan to be able to address whatever lack of skill or loss of skill that happened in that time to make sure that students, I guess, catch up a little bit with their learning, but also their therapies to ensure that um, as they come back to us in, in buildings, but also as they participate, some participate in distance learning, we um, meet each individual's child's need based on where they're at. So that's one thing that we're doing is coming up with that loss of skills plan if there is loss of skill, because not all kids lost skill over this, um, this time. Some kids have, have done pretty well and have progressed. And each and every IEP team are going to have that discussion with the parent and determine what needs to be done, uh, if anything needs to be done um, to make up for any kind of deficiency or lack of skill. And that's a really strong example of how families, teachers, students, that collaboration is just more important than ever right now. But now that you mention that, Amy, those students where they had the quality relationship with their service providers, their parents uh, or caregivers had that relationship with their service providers, from what we've experienced, those are the children that have done the best. Uh, not all, but the majority of the children, um, those relationships are most important when it comes to teaching and learning. If kids know that you care and, and you truly meet the child where they're at, especially when it comes to an ESC service perspective, um, we see the best growth in these kids. What about for the multicultural department and students whose families may speak other languages at home? How are you guys connecting with them and also evaluating those students to assess their language skills at this point? So absolutely. So very similar to uh, the work that Kevin's team is doing, uh, we are doing uh, the same work but uh, with a linguistic and a language focus. So um, all of our students who are emergent bilinguals, language learners, they have an ELL plan uh, that we've just actually created for all 26,000 of them um, at each school to make sure that we are really looking at last year's data, um, the language proficiency data we have at the, at the last year, and then where they are currently with their academic skills, but also their language skills. So we kind of look at both in, in our world and making sure that if they've uh, regressed in some way in terms of academic skills, we have certain interventions that we work through just like they would with any other student. Um, but in terms of language skills and their language proficiency, if they happen to show any kind of language regression, we're also having those same meetings with their parents and talking through here, what are the interventions, what are things that we can do together in partnership to help your students um, be really successful and continue to grow their language as they're growing their academic skills. So those are like really key meetings that are happening right now with those with the students and the teachers and the, the families as well. Um, we hold those uh, in whatever language um, that the families speak. So we're really working to make sure that we provide language assistance for not only the parents, but for the students as well in their classes, but also for just communication in general. So making sure that our families have as much information as they can, and then really helping families. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is we're, we're starting new videos um, in our multicultural YouTube channel that are specific about how to help support language uh, progression and language proficiency. So that's one of the things that we're doing. It's very similar to the Palm Skills Academy, but those are about academic skills. And so we'll be, those will be coming out in multiple languages over the next couple of weeks that are really specific around how do you help support your student at home in language proficiency and language development. I also want to make sure that we plug you guys have an education, a multicultural education family engagement night coming up. Yeah, as absolutely. Well. Thank you. Yeah, so, so next Thursday, uh, we have our family engagement night for all of our uh, emergent bilingual English, English language learner families. Um, we host that in English, Spanish, Haitian Creole, and Portuguese. That'll happen next Thursday night from 6 to 8. Um, and schools have that information, so that's going out to families right now. And actually, the week after that, the, uh, the 29th, our migrant families have an open house. Um, very similar. It's gonna, they're all going to be open house. It's going to be virtual, of course. But um, we are the, the whole goal of both of those meetings is to really engage with families in the languages that they speak and kind of talk with them about all different topics that the district has, but then also listen and answer questions and really give skills back and forth and, and make Make sure we're in partnership with them. So we'll be doing that in those languages in the next couple of weeks. And then we have some plans 
um, in no the end of November, December, to really focus on our Maya families, uh, those families who come from Guatemala. We'll be hosting the very similar uh, evening events, but in those languages, Kanhabal and Mom, and, and maybe even others, Kiche and Papti, if we can. So we're really working to, to meet, as Diana said, meet families where they are, but provide them the, the information in, that's accessible to them in languages that they understand so they can help their students be successful and we can work in partnership to, to make that happen. Yeah, those sound like some great events and initiatives that you guys have going on right now. Now, for all students, technology has been a part of the academic experience, but has become even more so. How are we ensuring equal access to technology between our different student populations right now? I know we have ordered a lot of Chromebooks uh, <laughs> since March. So where are we at with that one-to-one -one student ratio and incorporating technology into the experience for students? Dr. Sheffield, okay. Diana, <laughs> okay, well, of I'm not course, picky. <laughs> you know, with the uh, with the health of the community, particularly with our last um, you know referendum that did have some technology dollars tied there, uh, we have just been. I mean, we are still ordering um, devices um, for our students, but we're definitely very close to having that one to one um, devices for our students. And we have at this time we have put out over eighty thousand. Um, devices I think and you know and we already had prior to you know this space of COVID-19 where our schools where we working with our um, trailblazers and Google certified educators so we were definitely ahead of the ball game there so with this um, and that also brought into the smart boards and the other devices that we were using within our classrooms all of our elementary and middle high uh, middle schools um, have their smart boards. Um, our high schools are continuing being fitted um, as we speak. So we are definitely have moved um, to greater heights in the area of you know technology. And also in this space, we had to work with many of our families, you know, with the internet connectivity, um, and making certain that our students were also able to connect. And I just have to thank, take an opportunity to thank our business partners um, that assisted us, you know, with the internet connectivity and the hotspots and so forth and making sure that we were reaching our families. Technology has also played a pretty big role in serving ESE and ELL students as well. If you could both touch upon how that has really helped uh, to reach those students and uh, personalize the learning experience for them. So yeah, um, so one of the things that we've done is we've, we've worked to enhance our digital offerings. So of course we have online platforms that are similar to iReady and SuccessMaker that Dr. Sheffield already talked about, but that are specific for language development. Imagine Learning, iStation, um, and we've just expanded the opportunities there for other, as many students as possible to take part in those. We've also had um, some other platforms that we've used to really engage students um, this year, uh, Nearpod, Flipgrid, things of that, those have allowed us to really focus on language development and getting students inter engaged and, and maybe in new ways that uh, we had not seen before. And so we really focused on providing that professional development for teachers, but also for students to see how you can use these platforms to really continue to grow your language. Um, one of the things that we, we've been working on is just taking like the strategies we use for language development, um, some of our language scaffolds, and putting them in the electronic devices in terms of like Google Slides and Google Platforms. So, so that we're, we're doing the very similar things, but we're doing it in uh, new interactive ways that, so that whether you're in distance learning or you're in brick and mortar, you're still being able to participate in, in both ways and you're still being able to, to use those same language scaffolds and language strategies, but in, um, in, in both, both platforms. So we're really working hard to make sure that that's offered for all of our students. And for students with disabilities, we're doing very similar stuff. Um, for students with disabilities, there's a lot of not so much l English language learning acquisition, but a lot of students with disabilities have language um, processing. How do they receive language? How they express language? So these tools specifically are helping children and their fluency, how they, they can record themselves as they read through the technology. So. Um, it's giving them that experience at this point. Another major aspect is accessibility features. Um, in Google Chrome, there are many accessibility fe spe oh, sorry, features that um, really benefit students that they have access in the world, not only for their education, but for them to be able to access their community, to access information on, uh, through the internet, 
or any other mode of, of technology. So um, they're learning these features right now. They're learning how it helps them develop not only learning, but um, accessing the community. Um, so it's not only benefiting the children, it's benefiting the parents, because the parents are also seeing these accessibility features. One thing that Dr. Um, Sheffield and Diana had mentioned earlier was all the training that we've done for our parents. So this has become a phenomenal resource that we've not only made into other languages, a lot of it has been um, also translated into American Sign Language. So our deaf community out there is accessing information that historically they've never had access to before. So we as a team are trying to leverage all the expertise um, to be able to benefit our students' learning, uh, but also our, um, to build capacity in our family and community to be able to support that learning. And I also want to add in the piece for where technology, it's not that it was new, it's because that we've been using technology all along that we were able to pivot so quickly once our schools were shut down. Yeah. So because of the referendum and penny uh, sales tax, we were able to actually, and just so grateful to our community, we had so much technology in our school buildings before COVID started. So because of that, we had our teachers that were Google certified. We had our teachers that were utilizing technology. We had students that were in Google Classrooms way before any of this started. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we had, more, we had more Google certified educators in our one little school district than any other school district in the world. Again, pre-COVID. It's because of that that we were able to pivot so successfully in March. So even the teachers that didn't know how to use the technology when we left, they had teachers within their buildings that knew how to, so they had somebody to reach out to. Yeah. And I, be, without that, I'm not sure we would have been as successful as we were. And again, not that we didn't have a lot of moments of growth that we had to go through, we all did. But we were able to build on the strengths that we had, and it's because of the community and you know what they were able to give us beforehand, and we were so grateful to that. So we had technology that we were able to leverage even before that, and very grateful for that. And that collaborative teaching and planning among teachers, therapists, service providers has been a huge benefit to our kids. Yeah, you guys made a Google Classroom over the summer that it was just for teachers and those who were per participating in extended school year, I remember. You had invited me to it so I could just see a little bit of the knowledge that was being shared in there that was unbelievable. I so it's not only for teachers, it's for our paraeducators, our paraprofessionals to be able to fully leverage their expertise and build their knowledge not only in technology, but to also how they can better support children while they're in the general education classroom or their, their special education classroom to be able to um, you know, enhance the support and, and benefit their education. And the trailblazers, I have to say, are incredible. All of our teachers are incredible right now, every single one. <laughs> the <Absolutely>. trailblazers, <laughs> some of the creativity that they've been sharing, we've been highlighting some of them on our social media, Trailblazer Tuesdays. Everyone can scroll down on Facebook and, and find the one just from this Tuesday of just the incredible tools they've been using to really engage students in all areas. It's, it's unbelievable and is in big part because of that infrastructure, that training, the Google, Google certification process was already in place. We do have a question I want to make sure to get to from Holly about ensuring fairness when it comes to testing or homework or that sort of thing for students who are doing distance learning versus in the classroom, ensuring that there isn't cheating or that sort of thing going on for students who are learning from home. We have some policies in place about that. Well, and that's why, you know, when I talk about the academic honesty and, you know, and the academic integrity and those variables that we have control over, there are some variables that we can control and some that we cannot. Um, and that's why I also said that with the assessments where they are not punitive, it is to help inform teaching and learning, and particularly with the fall diagnostics. Now, what I will say, you know, with our winter diagnostics um, that we're looking at doing, um, because we will be having, you know, state testing, um, our state testing calendar will be going to the board on October the 21st, because as of this moment, the states still have their state calendar up, so we're assuming that we will have state testing. 
So in terms of trying to continue to gauge and working with our families, the winter diagnostics, you know, we want to run and simulate it and give them that experience in that environment in which they would have to take their state testing. And simply for the, um, for the concern in which Holly has presented is in regards, how can we ensure fairness? How can we ensure that the environment um, and the academic hon honesty and the integrity is held tight for our students that are distance learning, um, like our, for our students that will be brick and mortar. So we will be having discussion as a district staff in regards to what can we do um, as it pertains for the winter diagnostics to provide our students with that um, tight, you know, stimulation of the FSA in which they would have to take and to get some real, real hard data um, as we're trying to close that gap and making certain that they are prepared. Thank you for, for all that information and for talking about testing as well. We have a question related to that from David, um, whose child is doing distance learning and he's asking how his child will be able to take standardized tests like the SAT mm -hmm. and AP exams. Is there going to be a process uh, to either maybe take those from home? I know the AP did that this mm -hmm. past spring. I believe that probably remains to be seen and then as well as SAT and ACT? Well, College Board, of course, um, you know, we would have to wait on College Board um, to make a determination in regards to what that testing environment will look like at the end of the year, you know. And um, for ACT, we do have school day ACT, school day SAT. Um, those, um, those students will have to come to campus. Um, those tests would not be administered, um, you know, through distance learning, through the digital platform. Those are standard-based tests. So for any student that will be doing a school day ACT, school day SAT, they will have to come to campus. And then our Saturday administration of the SAT, ACT, where they register through the different testing agencies, those are on our, on our campuses, um, you know, as they will sign up and register. They do have very strict protocols in very place. Strict, very strict protocol, and you know, we were excited, again, listening at our families um, and our students to where we had not offered um, ACT, SAT since we closed in March, and we opened back up in September. And so um, we tested well over 1,000 plus students between ACT, SAT, and it was very successful. I do want to you know, thank our principals, thank the testing coordinators, um, for those that work the testing sites to give our students the opportunity um, for the ACT, SAT testing. And we will continue with that. Another big part uh, for all students, especially high school students though, and this was something that they really, I know, were, were missing back in March in the very beginning of the school year, sports. Mm -hmm. uh, where are we at now with restarting athletics and are there opportunities also for distance learners to be able to still take part in those sports? Well, we have, re we have issued a re-engagement plan of athletics. Um, that re-engagement plan, it can be found there on our district site. I will know, and there are some very strict guidelines as it pertains to that re-engagement plan because we do have to hold tight in regards to the safety um, and the health protocols, which is very important to us. And at the same time, we want to give our students um, that experience. So our um, fall season, um, some of our sports have already started. Um, I know football starts, um, I think it's that Friday, October the 30th, um, and the schedules have already been finalized and released. We have a specific question for Kevin. Christine says that her son has a 504, he's doing distance learning. How can she be sure that his teachers have an understanding of his, the plan and then follow through with all of the accommodations if they've never met him as a student? And that's the case for a lot of students right now and teachers that they haven't actually met each other. But how can she be sure that there's going to be follow through of, of that? Well, first and foremost, it's communication between the teacher and the parent. So if the teacher and the parent has not been communicating, definitely set up a time, as Dr. Sheffield said, during their office hours or an individual parent-teacher conference to be able to have the discussion of how the child's benefiting, possibly how the child's struggling. But there's also guidance for her um, on our district website. There's a Q&A for um, accommodations. There's guidance of how to access accommodations through distance learning. 
So I would highly recommend that she look up that information, uh, but also contact uh, the school. That first and foremost, the, the teacher to make sure that there's that open line of communication. Uh, you wanna know what the teacher is seeing from that side, and also the teacher needs to hear about what you're seeing as a parent um, to be able to better support that child's learning while in distance learning. Yes, and, and you, in your department, a lot of the students have stayed uh, doing distance learning because of health concerns and that sort of thing. So you guys really are doing everything you can to make sure you are supporting them through teletherapies and, and things like that as well, right? Absolutely. So years ago, uh, six years when I started, six years ago when I started this position, we looked into teletherapy and it just didn't work for us at the time. Um, since then, um, it, it, teletherapy has its own acceptable practice which within speech and language pathology specifically for kids who benefit. So we've continued teletherapy uh, for those children who are able to benefit, whose parents provide consent for us to continue to deliver services in that way. Um, but yes, it is, it is sad because there are some students that are not able to attend schools right, school right now who don't quite benefit in that way. And it's because of health reasons. And, and as we said months ago, health and safety is still a priority for us. So if children can't come to our school buildings right now to receive in-person services, we are still doing our best as we did back then to be able to um, provide as much access to education as we can right now. And what I mean by education is both teaching, but as well um, as, as therapies, speech and language pathology, occupational therapy, physical therapy, um, all of those efforts have continued while we're in this blended space. Yeah, I think that's incredible that you all have been able to do that, and that's in big help with the technology that has been given out to all students and that they have access to that at home to be able to receive those services and that sort of thing. We have a question as well about graduation dates. Do we have any idea yet what potential graduation dates could be? Of course, the school year was pushed back three weeks as well. Yeah. well. No, we do not have the graduation dates yet. I can say that leadership is in discussion in regards to, um, you know, graduation dates, the class of 2021, and what um, will that experience looks like. And we will definitely notify our community. And again, we will make certain that we get the buy-in. We have another question for Kevin here about, it's from Molly, what if my child is virtual and doing well as an ESE student, but then begins to struggle in a month or so? Would this be an example, and this also might mm -hmm. be a question for either of you, of applying for the waiver to that you know, locked in of the make your choice uh, yes. Selection. Well, I definitely want to intercede there. Um, and Kevin, I'm sorry because, you know, I, my, I, I was reading it live. My, <laughs> I'm going to say <laughs> my top priority is, you know, our top priority here is making certain that we're setting our students up for success. And as we talk about, you know, making that choice and wanting students um, and wanting to know um, in regards to that commitment for fall semester to where we can stabilize. That's that big piece. Just stabilize for the teachers and for the students. We do realize that there are indeed extenuating circumstances. And I can assure you that is one of those extenuating circumstances. If we have a student and they are, they've made that choice of distance learning and they're not performing academically and there are some, some immediate needs that we need and they need to return to brick and mortar, absolutely. Can I just add to that a little bit? Please do. All the, just on the educational part yes. of it because we wanna be sure that our parents don't provide too much support for their children. As far as don't do it for them. Mm -hmm. There is a, a, a benefit to children struggling with learning a little bit because that struggle allows them to better attain concepts. That's what our, our teachers are really good at. That's what our therapists are really good at. If we see that they're struggling, that informs us almost even better than these standardized tests that we were talking about. That real-time feedback between the service provider and the child is critical for us to be able to understand in order to address, uh, adjust our methods of teaching, but also to better understand how the students are um, truly gaining the information, hopefully up through mastery. But if they're not getting it up through mastery, it allows us to be able to circle back and reteach concepts or teach it in a different way. If parents are supporting too much, then the child, we're not gonna get that information and the child may not benefit as much as they possibly could while home learning. And talking about those 
again, the family connection. We have another question. This one is for Harvey about making sure we're reaching out to minority communities and, and making sure that those students in particular feel safe and supported. It's daunting when you uh, are somewhere where you might not understand the language that people are speaking and then we have masks on and all the, these different sorts of changes. How are we really supporting those students and their families right now and making sure that they feel supported? Absolutely. So we have lots of people throughout our district who are uh, community language facilitators. That's our biggest piece. So we have people at every school who are helping provide that language support and just that comforting ear. And even just today, we had a, a new student who arrived. Um, the student speaks Italian and the school doesn't have someone who speaks Italian. So we found somebody on the district staff who's gonna check in on the students um, every week or whatever. And just to, just to make sure that they're doing okay, uh, the school's doing all they can to provide all the language support they need to. Uh, but you know, just like you said, just a little bit more uh, guidance, a little bit more checking in. So we're doing that throughout our entire district. We have uh, bilingual counselors, we have bilingual um, support staff, and we have a lot of district staff who are going out, our migrant advocates, really into the community, talking with families, talking with parents, just to make those connections and making sure that um, we're breaking down those walls and really making sure that everyone's understanding. If you're not understanding, how can we provide the information maybe in a different way? Um, that's why we're starting the videos. That's why we've done a lot of that work over the summer, um, just to make sure that just, you know, it's translated on paper, it's translated orally, but everything we can do just to make sure that we're connecting to as many parts of our community as possible. That's a great example too of we can find the person to speak that language or help that student. I mean, just the number of languages that are spoken in our schools and among our staff is, is unbelievable. And we have 20,000 staff members and mm -hmm. who speak a lot of different languages and have lots of different experiences Absolutely. to help relate to, to our students and families. So we have a question about Physical education, um, Alina, sorry, I hope I pronounced that correctly, asked this about physical education right now for distance learners, how they are receiving that sort of enrichment during their school day. So just physical education as a class, whether from kindergarten through, through high school, just like any other course. So we are teaching physical education um, in distance learning like we are all of our other courses. Um, it might look a little bit different depending on which grade level uh, that it would be if students were in brick and mortar. Uh, but we are posting lessons and resources via the Google Classroom. So our teachers are reaching out, teachers in the school, uh, school, each school, they're reaching out, they're posting lessons, posting resources. Some are teaching it live um, and some because the actual physical education teacher is outside maybe perhaps on the track and field or outside on the field. They're posting lessons for students to go into the Google Classroom and perform on their own, some exercises and activities. But absolutely, our students are still doing physical education, even if they're home. I've seen some great videos on social media of students doing jumping jacks and planks uh, in front of their computer. It's pretty amazing. We have another question, and this definitely you know, goes along with distance learning and the conversation we've all been having about how long distance learning is going to be an option for families. I believe that mm -hmm. remains to be seen yet as yes, of right now. Yes, definitely that will remain to, remain to be seen. Um, and it will all depend on, you know, um, you know, with the state. Right now we're working in an executive or, in, with an executive order um, that talks about the fall semester. So we're just continuing with and collaborating, you know, with the Florida Department of Education and we will um, await to see. And while this could be going on for a little while longer, depending on what those decisions are, what the situation mm -hmm. of the pandemic in our community is as well, we have a question from Carla asking about teachers receiving additional training for supporting those students that are having a hard time participating in distance learning lessons. I'm not sure if she means live, maybe mm -hmm. they're you know nervous to speak up or they're mm -hmm. at home um, and there could be other things going on. She said specifically for middle schoolers where participating is a big part of their grade. So we have been doing ongoing professional development and just like teachers had to completely change and they changed on a dime the way they've done instruction in the central office, we've all had to change the way we've done professional development, exact same concept. So we've done, the, we've done that as well. And on July 6th, we unveiled out our professional development series, doing live sessions and also putting out recorded sessions 
so teachers could access it in the manner that best fit them but those have been ongoing so we are still offering professional development to our teachers on how to best engage students during this time because engaging students when you have some in the brick and mortar classroom and some at home and teaching them simultaneously and teaching middle school because I taught middle school for 14 years right that so that's a lot and doing both at the same time so we are doing a lot of professional development and doing that live for our teachers even coaching them in one by one so that is absolutely ongoing professional development work we're still doing but I think it's important too, Amy, to note that our substitutes have access to that training that Diana referred to that we launched um, on July 6th. That's great to know. We've, we have gotten some questions about that in the past on social media that I remember seeing. So that's really good to know. And I do know we are hiring substitutes. While we're on this, I might as well say that. Uh, the school district is hiring substitute teachers if anybody wants to apply for that. We have another question about, here it is teaching writing in a distance learning environment. And I know that, that seems pretty broad, but how is that particular subject and skill being worked on for distance learners in particular? So we are absolutely still teaching writing, even in a distance learning environment. And our teachers in, whether it's elementary, middle school, or high school, have been working with them in that case. They've been teaching uh, writing Sometimes our students are handwriting it out on paper, maybe holding it up to the camera. I've seen lots of examples and videos of that. The handwriting, and I'm not sure if that's what the, the person who wrote in meant, the handwriting's been a little trickier, but our teachers are just masters, what they've been able to come up with. So they've been uh, bringing up either a lot of handwriting videos or been able to really use a lot of the technology that we've had to help show our students how to write. Um, and that's this is where it goes back to one of the questions you posed earlier. We're really counting for some of our little ones where they're just mastering the concept of how do you hold a pencil? Um, how do you start writing? This is where we're really counting on our caregivers and our families to help with that. Because that's where you start really having the hand over hand assistance that typically in a classroom we would start using and that's where we've been asking for that. But it's been a lot of videos, a lot of showing them how teachers turning their cameras on their hands and showing them how to do that. And then students showing, that, you know, showing their teachers how they're doing it. So we've seen some amazing innovative pieces out there, but it's definitely all still happening. So they're also using our um, Google Suite. So Google Slides gives real-time feedback. So if uh, the student opens up a Google slide, and let's say it's elementary, and they're working on beginning, you know, middle, and end. So their their opening of whatever story or prompt that they're giving, uh, the teacher can go in real time, and as long as they share it with the teacher in comment or ask questions and have them elaborate or work on a specific aspect that they may be struggling with. So even in writing, they're leveraging the technology to be able to uh, improve their methods of teaching. And I think some of this stuff just isn't gonna go away. Oh, definitely not, I hope not. <laughs> Our education has improved so much. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, what this global pandemic has done to our world, I mean, just it's heartbreaking but there have been so many positives coming out of education that we are seeing and that have changed um, that I think we need to grow on and, and, and take. There are some pieces that we definitely wanna go back. We want, we wanna have our love our students back in the building when it's safe, right? We want those things back, but there have been some additional pieces that we know we can keep, right? The use of technology even more so than we had it before. Um, that we want to be able to keep growing, uh, the, the choice for our students, for so many of our students that were sick but are now able to then still keep learning, right? Can remote into a classroom and keep learning even if they're sick. There's so many aspects that we can take and grow on and keep going with that it's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of just the pandemic overall, of course, is just constantly fluctuating and we are all going along with those ebbs and flows every which way since March. We have another question that is related to make your choice about those exemptions. If cases were to start going up again in this area and someone does feel uncomfortable, we talked a little bit about the academic piece of that, but also health concern piece of that. Would that 
qualify for one of those waiver exemptions? Well, I mean, I would hate to speak. Um, they're working on the exemptions, and I have not seen the complete listing of exemptions, but I spoke very bravely in regards to our students not performing um, and struggling academically, because that was definitely at the very top. But there are extenuating circumstances, and we are here to work with our families mm -hmm. and with our students. Absolutely, health, safety, academic, all of it. student success, it's all, all a part of this and is all so important. We have a question, and this is one of, I think, our last couple questions that we're going to ask tonight, but this one says, what are some advantages of taking the PSAT in eighth grade instead of ninth grade? Hmm. Kind of back to the standardized <laughs> testing. It was very different from what we were talking about before. <laughs> so is the PSAT in eighth grade? Or yes, is? instead of ninth grade. It, I yes, don't think it's, all good. it's really anything to do with the pandemic specifically. Yes. Uh, this person is just looking for some advice. <laughs> sure, the PSAT in eighth grade gives us AP college potential. So it, it identifies and provides some data to the incoming high school, whichever high school that student is going to. It provides that principal who probably doesn't know a whole lot about that student. It provides them principal, um, what's called AP college potential. It allows them to know which AP classes that that particular child might be successful in, in order to allow that child some um, college, you know, college going opportunities. And the AP courses, or ACE courses also, because they might go that route, are incredibly beneficial for students. Because besides the fact that it's just an incredibly rigorous education, which is clearly a, a positive for our students, um, it, it exposes them to a level of coursework that they may not have. But if students take the exam at the end of the year and successfully earn a certain score, they can leverage that into college coursework if that's the, the path they choose to take, which means then you know they don't have to pay for that coursework when they go to college. So it's a savings for parents. So it really does work on so many levels. Um, and that's a pathway with that eighth grade test. So it's a good thing. And can I just say, one of the things that I, I, I really think is important about our district that I think people really need to understand is those opportunities, and when we talk about these opportunities are, are good for everyone, the district, the superintendent, the school board, everyone recognizes that they really mean everyone. Like they're talking about English language learners, students with disabilities. So these opportunities, all the things we've talked about are really with an equity lens so that everyone has these opportunities to participate and then have other doors open for them. And I think that's just really important for people to recognize that every conversation we've had since we've been in closed down and even before that has always been about what's right for all students, and then how do we help support individual students differently, but really what can we do for everyone that's, that's the right thing to do for them. And that PSAT is one of those just examples where we provide that opportunity for everyone to open more doors for every student. So just, I think it's just, we have to say that out loud because it's important to recognize that that's a real big cornerstone of our district. Choice programs are absolutely a part of that too. And we do have the showcase of schools coming up next week, which will kick off with a Facebook Live information session, question and answer session as well. That is going to be next Tuesday, October 20th at 4 p.m. And the showcase of schools is entirely virtual this year. I know we also look forward to going to the fairgrounds and seeing all of the students there. And they talk so passionately about the programs that they are in. It's beautiful to see but we'll be doing that in more of an online format this year. And so I want to make sure that everybody knows that that's happening. We also have the College and Career Fair coming up. That's also virtual. That's on Wednesday, October 21st. So that will be very exciting as well and wraps up a lot of what we're talking about here in student choice and success and successful paths to the future. I also want to make sure that we recognize why some of us are wearing some different colors here today. It is <laughs> Dyslexia Awareness Month. It is also the very end of Hispanic Heritage Month, and it is Spirit Day. Principal Appreciation Month. Principal Appreciation Month. Custodian Appreciation Month. <laughs> Bully Can't Prevention Month. And LG I, LGBTQ, LGBTQ History Month. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like, it, I was going to say, did we, did we get all of them? October is um, a very popular month. It is a very <laughs> popular month. So we hope that everybody celebrates uh, just the amazing diversity, inclusivity that we have here in the school district of Palm Beach County and making sure that we personalize the educational experience to everyone. We certainly appreciate all of those who are watching our Facebook Live. This will be recorded if you want to go back and watch 
watch any of it over again and hear those questions again. And we hope you'll join us on Tuesday, October 20th, for the Showcase of Schools information session right here on Facebook as well. Thank you. Thank you.